Hey everyone and welcome to this week's episode of BSD Synergy. This week's episode is part one of a series called SSH. It can do that. So I said in my past couple videos that I'm going to be doing a video on SSH and I had originally intended for this video to only be one video. I really didn't think there would be that much. But thanks to this fancy book right here in which I'm, you know, very graciously stealing all of my information and knowledge, um, I have found out that I really can't fit all of this into one video. Um, if I did, the video would be like eight hours long and nobody would watch it. So this video is actually gonna be multiple videos. We're gonna be having part one today, and then part two will come in the future. My best guess is it's gonna be actually two weeks from now. Next week's episode is actually gonna be a rather different episode. It's gonna be a kind of special episode. I'm actually going on vacation, so I'll actually be recording that video right after I record this video. Um, if not the same night or, you know, another night. So I hope I don't disappoint too many of you with this change. Uh, I did, I, I, it took me a while. I spent a long time thinking about it. Man, do I really want to split it? But after going through all that OpenSSH has to offer and learning a lot of things that I myself did not know, I felt that I really should pause and wait and make sure that I cover everything because OpenSSH really is, if it wasn't such an important software, I just would have left it alone and, you know, skipped over all of these things. But since it's pretty much a de facto standard for all remote server integration and stuff, kind of need to go over it in depth. So anyways, uh, I hope you've noticed this week that I'm no longer wearing my uh, headset. I finally got my mic setup figured out. Um, and now I don't need a headset anymore, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you if you like the audio quality or you notice a, a difference, uh, let me know in the comments below. Uh, I really want to know if this is the right mic, if I've got it set the right way. Um, it sounds good to my ear, but I definitely would like to know what you have to think. Another thing that some of you might have noticed this past week is there are now ads on my YouTube videos. And I want to go ahead and address this issue because even though I don't think anybody said it yet, I'm pretty sure somebody's going, wow, he's monetizing off of this um and one no i'm not okay um this week alone i was looking at my youtube revenue uh i made two dollars off of the ads on these videos so i'll go buy a coat but that actually wasn't the point of me adding the ads um i thought hey you know i want to give back to these organizations i want to give to freebsd i want to give to openbsd and you know donate and I was like, you know, there are people that are liking the channel. I could generate a little bit of ad revenue from it and give it back to the community. Um, and I'm going to give a certain percentage of that of the revenue back to the community. The likelihood is it's probably going to be close to 100%. Uh, if I continue to make $2 a week at the end of the end of the year, I will have made, you know, $104. I was planning on giving that much to the, the community anyway. I was planning on making a pretty decent donation to the community. So that'd be 100%. Um, I may also use this fund to dip in and pull out for improvements for the show, like maybe getting some better lighting. You know, right now it looks really like, looks like, look like Jesus is coming behind me. It's so freaking white, uh, with the lights and, you know, maybe a better camera or some things, you know, things to make the show better or hardware. You know, some people have asked for some pretty interesting things. Like somebody had asked for me in the comments to do an iSCSI mount with FreeNAS on an ESXi system. I don't have any of that stuff, and I would actually need to get a license for ESXi. Um, while I could easily do that as a show, um, somebody has to pay for that. So I was like, okay, I could use this to kind of make the show better and give back to the community. For me, I think it's a good idea. Now, <laughs> you know, I know a lot of people get on YouTube and they want to be a famous YouTuber, not me. Um, if I did, I would have chosen a channel or a topic that uh, actually had a chance um, of getting me 4 million subscribers. Now, that being said, if my channel does get that big, what that really means is that we've won. That the open source community uh, has won, and that would be a great thing. However, not doing this for money, not doing this for personal gain, really kind of doing this to inform the community and help out, and also, I'm learning at the same time. And actually, another bit of news, sorry for all the channel news this week, but it's actually been a relatively interesting week for the channel. Um, I actually have been in contact and discussion with uh, the people for Jupiter Broadcasting that do the BSC Now podcast. They're happy with my channel and they are behind me. And that's that's something that I really, really like to hear. You know, it's good to know that the community is big enough for two people doing broadcasts on BSD. And after talking with them, you know, it's and, and I think I made this observation in my first 
episode uh, when I was talking about why I was doing this channel. The BSD Now stuff is fantastic, but even the majority of it goes over my head. Way over my head. So this channel really is going to be focused for beginners. It's going to be kind of a tutorial spot, an introduction to BSDs. Um, it's not going to always be that way. There are going to be some rather advanced topics and tutorials, but I'm really going to focus this channel on on the introductory on the beginner at least for the time being you know if you if you think about it think of this channel as a collegiate course or a class or any you know class that you took you know we, we've literally just started we we've gotten our feet wet we but we need to go forward and we need to learn and we really can't learn without the uh without the fundamentals if you've seen by the moving of my chair I, you know, I have a piano back behind me. I rearranged my office. My trombone's on the floor. Um, I am a musician, and fundamentals are a big thing to musicians. As you, if, if you, any of you are practiced and, act, and actually have degrees in music, which I, I do. I have, a, I have an undergraduate degree in music as well as computer science. Uh, you realize that you will practice the fundamentals your entire life. And really, the better you are at the fundamentals, the better you are at your job. And it's not always the exact same parallel in CS, but it's true. If we try to go into these really advanced topics, but we don't understand how SSH works, for example, then, then, then we're really doing ourselves no good. We're, we're, we're kind of just pissing in the wind. So for those of you that are hoping that this channel will be really advanced, it will. Someday. That being said, I hope you continue to tune back in, because even though I'm going to be covering little things, one of the things that I've learned is, even though you think you know everything about a topic, you might still learn one thing. And learning that one thing makes it worth it. There's a new option that you didn't know about. So I hope you like it. I hope, I hope I've hope i clarified a little bit more. I still really want the advanced topic options as suggestions in the comments. I really do. Because I've I finally, I've got a spreadsheet together. I'm planning things out. I'm trying to do a better job of announcing to you what videos are coming up and not splitting them. I'm going to hopefully do a better job of that. Um, the Open SSH video will have at least one more part. Depending on how setting up an open VPN in, a, in SSH works, might have a separate video all for that. So I hope you like it and I hope you're looking forward to this episode. And a new thing that I'm going to try to do uh, from now on in every episode is before I get into the demo, I'm going to cite my sources. Um, I do have the desire to write a thesis, get my master's, eventually get my PhD, and you have to cite your sources. So the sources in which I have used to build this wonderful video that you are watching today is the OpenSSH website and uh, SSH Mastery by Michael W. Lucas. I'm even stealing some of his jokes and I'm trying to quote him at all times, but if I forgot to quote him on it in the video, I apologize, Michael, if you're watching. I'm not trying to rip off your work. You just, you, these are hilarious. If you haven't read his books, read his books. I read them and I laugh because they're funny. It's a book on OpenSSH. Funny shouldn't be anywhere near that sentence, but it is. Okay, so why am I doing an episode on OpenSSH? Like many popular tools, the majority of people only use the bare minimum or like this much of a tool that is huge and don't really realize all the cool things that it has to offer. Um, it is a software product that was written and is maintained by a BSD community. It was written by the OpenBSD community and they actively maintain it. It is extremely secure and it is pretty much the de facto standard when it comes to remote machine access. SSH is actually a protocol for creating an encrypted communication channel between networked hosts. It was created in 1995 by Tatu Yulin, I can't really say his name, and it quickly replaced protocols such as Telnet, RSH, and RLogin. So what is OpenSSH? OpenSSH is the most popular SSH implementation. It was developed in 1999 um, and actually forked from SSH 1.2.12 um, because the licensing was getting weird and there's a lot of weird history going on with that. Uh, so the OpenBSD community decided to jump on board with this and they released it as OpenSSH 1.2.2 and OpenBSD 2.6 which was released on December 1st, 1999. They removed all the gunk from it and made it BSD licensed and it became widely popular almost immediately. So about OpenSSH, there's a lot of stuff to cover in SSH. I'm not possibly going to be able to cover it all in this video so 
be looking out for my next videos. Um, it has a client server set up where the client connects to a machine that is running an SSH server and people are allowed to get into the machine through that server. It has protocol versions and you must always use SSH2. If someone asks you to use SSH1, you say no. If someone insists that you use SSH1, you tell them hell no. And if someone threatens to fire you, burn down your village and pillage all of your farms, if you don't use SSH1, then I guess you, you know, you kind of have to do it, but you better practice your I told you speech. Uh, I prefer the I informed you thus leak. It's a little bit more eloquent, but basically SSH1 is vulnerable to men in the middle and session hijacking attacks. And if you use it, your shit's going to get messed up. So that being said, let's go ahead and get on into our demo today. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the SSH clients. So there are quite a few clients out there, but the two main ones that most people know about are the open SSH client for Unix and putty for windows. Now you could use Sigwin, uh, to install, you know, a bash like environment inside of windows and install just the regular SSH client or with nowadays even with bash on windows 10, you could use that. Uh, but we're really not going to get into the Windows specific things. We're going to mostly focus on just your regular open SSH client. For, for what we're doing, all of this stuff really is pretty much the same. So in your client, you actually have two main configurations. You have the configuration in slash etc slash ssh slash ssh underscore config, which is actually the server configuration. This configuration file is used for everybody on the system. And then you have actually have your, your SSH configuration, which is in your home directory .ssh slash config. Okay. So there's a lot of options you can do inside your config. And we're just going to touch on some of the really basic useful ones. So I currently do have an SSH directory and I have an authorized key directory. I'm currently working on a FreeBSD droplet from DigitalOcean. Um, so I already have an authorized key to get into here. Not really going to cover authorized key in this tutorial. That's going to be next tutorial. But if you really want to know, Google it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say host aries.masonegger.com. Then we're going to tab over and I actually have configured this server to run on port 2222. So we're going to go ahead and try SSHing into that now. This should override it so where I can, instead of having to do SSH-P 2222, which P is the port, I can now just do SSH uh, mEgger at aries.masonegger.com. And it automatically finds it, if you can see, on port 2222. And I'm going to say no for now, just to prove that it actually worked. Now I can even, I can make it a little bit more generic to say that I have all servers running on 2222. Well, your, your conf file does support, you know, wildcards. So I can try that again. And there you go. It has found it. I'm going to keep denying that host key verification just for now until I get to the point that I want to make. Now, if I decide to do say the IP address of Aries, which is 104.236.225.84 and put that across port 2222. And now if I try to just say, let's just do SSH. Let's try to do that across its IP 104.236.225.84. It also has determined that it is across it by that. Now, what if say I put something inside my Etsy host file for DNS, for, you know, basic DNS lookup. And I do 104.236.225.84, and I do Aries. I don't put the masonegger.com there. If I try to just SSH to Aries, it's gonna be connection refused. And you're gonna ask, well, why? So the command line takes exactly what you give it. Since I gave it Aries, it looked at Aries. It did not try to DNS resolve this IP address. So if I really want to, I can say host Aries port 2222. Now, if I try to SSH to Aries, now it shows up. Again, going to say no. So the next thing we're going to talk about is identifying the fingerprint. As you can see on the screen, I have 
constantly been saying no because I have yet to identify that fingerprint. The server could be lying to me. I could be in the middle of a man in the middle attack right now. So how do we verify? Well, OpenSSH will give you this fingerprint that you see right here. And this fingerprint is a shorter, you know, calculated version of the private key of the server. Because all of the SSH communication is you know, done by public private key encryption. So with that, I need to be able to go to my actual machine and I need to make sure that the fingerprint matches. So some commands we can do use to do this is we can do a SSH key scan on our local host and pipe that to a text file, fingerprint.txt. Now, as you can see here, it refused, but weird enough, it refused six times. And we're gonna get over to that in, in the server in a little bit, but actually the server prints six attempts before it fails. And that is the default in OpenSSH. So what I have to do here is I have to specify my port. Okay, and now I have the keys. And then they are now in a text file. And now I can do ssh-keygen-lf-fp.txt. And those are, my, those are my keys. So the one that we're getting over here is awx gup itty blah, 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 blah. And if we go back over here, we find the ed, the ed ecdsa. We find that it is the same fingerprint. Therefore, we can accept this machine. So... I'm going to try to SSH into Aries. We're going to accept it. And FreeBSD at FreeBSD. And what I've realized now is there's no password. I have used the wrong user. So I can do a couple things. I can SSH into Aries and I can say mEgger at Aries. I can do dash L mEgger. Or I can modify my config file again. So. If we modify our config for Aries, I want to use user mEgger instead of my typical FreeBSD username. So now if I SSH to Aries, my mEgger name is right there. Now a couple of other things to go to know about is you have your known hosts file. This known hosts file is the public key of the server, Aries. And one of the things that you might want to do uh, to protect your server identity, say that this machine were to get compromised, somebody could go in here, they would get the public key, and they could see the host that I'm connecting to. And likelihood is, is if they did manage to break into the server via SSH, they can maybe exploit the same things. You know, they may not get anything out of it, but it's always good that we protect our identities. So one of the things we can do in here is I can do ssh keygen dash h which now creates a known host and a known host dot old so if i cat known hosts it's now hashed and people won't be able to get the identity of the server from the known host file and if i do ssh to aries it still recognizes it see how it didn't do any of that it now knows that that's okay Okay, so by deleting my SSH keys from the server and now re having them reconfigured, basically deleting them and restarting the server, which will regenerate the keys, I'm going to show you what happens if you try to SSH into a server and the key is different. And as you can see, this is a huge warning, red flags, we are fucked. Basically, this means that something is wrong. And this is a very, very serious error. This means that something has changed on your on their end but basically your keys are not matching up and it's not the same machine and it's not going to let you connect whenever this happens you should contact an administrator immediately and have them take a look if for some reason they have done what i've done and they've recomputed the keys that's fine you go in you edit the you edit your known hosts file remove that re-add the key make sure the fingerprints the same you're fine but this is a very telltale warning that somebody is in the middle of you and they're trying to stop you from gaining access to your machine and trying to trick you into going into theirs so that's some pretty interesting things to know about the client side let's go over to the server side now most of your configurations exist within your slash etc slash ssh that's actually where majority of all your server stuff will live the ssh config that i talked about that is server 
side for every user on your machine will have that in there unless they overwrite it. So first things first, the SSHD config, as you can see right here, the port, I am choosing live, live, listen across 2222, address family, IPv4 or IPv6, listen addresses, default for any one of these. You can specify these to very specific IP addresses. Say you have a multi-homed machine, you only want it listening on one of the ports, just add an IP address there. Default protocol is two, they make you change it if you wanna make it one. Um, if you have to make somebody use one, you can do a comma one, and that will allow you to, you know, have one as well as two. The SSH client will choose two over one, but if it must speak one, you can use that. Not gonna do that, that's bad. Here are where your host keys are, key regeneration interval, uh, server key bits, log level, that's good to know. You can put this all the way down to verbose, which doesn't violate any user privacy to debug where you're basically stealing passwords at that point and don't put it in debug tis bad login grace time two minutes this is remember what i mentioned earlier that those six tries to restart that's right there the max off tries it tried six times before a single connection is broken it made a single connection trying to scan it six times it failed and then the connection was broken so some of the interesting things that some people don't necessarily know about OpenSSH is that you can actually deny, allow users and groups. So you basically have deny users, you have allow users, you have deny groups, and you have allow groups. These lists are executed in that exact order. First thing is you deny your user, then you allow the user, deny the group, and allow the group. The first one it triggers on is the one that it's going to do. So say for example, I have allow groups employees. All of my employees can, or by default, can log into this machine. But I don't want a certain subset of them. So I create a subset of my employees, a subgroup, if you will, called naughty. So I deny the groups from naughty. They aren't going to be allowed in. All the other employees are, but deny groups are not. The presence of allow users or allow groups implies that somebody has to log in or that, that there's only gonna be a certain set of people that are allowed log in. So if you're gonna set them, you have to set them. So you actually would have to say this group is logging in or this user is allowed to log in and everybody else blocked by default. So I can I'll deny user uh, root. I don't want root being able to log in but I can allow user mEgger to log in. I want to allow the group, uh, you know, wheel to log in. So I'm allowing wheel to log in and then deny groups. Uh, I don't want the WWW group to be able to log in. So that this would work, you know, the wheel group is the only group that's allowed to log in. Um, the deny group of WWW is a little bit redundant seeing as how they already weren't gonna be allowed to log in anyways because only wheel is allowed to log in for group wise. Um, but say M. Egger is not a part of users or of wheel, he is also allowed to log in. And then root, even though we're allowing people in wheel to log in, root is typically in wheel. Wheel is, if you don't know, the Unix, usually BSD uh, master group. We're not allowing root to log in. And you can be even more specific. So say, you know, this main thing also runs like SFTP, SCP. Those are things that are tied into the OpenSSH configuration. Well, what if I want mEgger to be able to log in, but he's going to be using like SCP and I don't want him to be able to log in from say home and steal company secrets. Not that he would, but let's just say that like we only want him to be able to log in from this system, you know, from a certain system. You can actually do at like 192.168.0.0 slash 24. You actually got to type 24. That's actually totally acceptable. Now, it's probably not best to manage all of this kind of stuff from within inside of OpenSSH. Uh, probably better to use like a perimeter firewall or something like that, but it does actually work and that's pretty cool. Now, we also have things for matching, which allows us to actually have conditionals within inside of it. So say um, I want to do some X1140. But only, you know, the, only the group wheel gets to X11 forward. So let's go ahead and do match group wheel X11 forwarding. Yes, the group wheel is now allowed to X11 forward. You can actually have conditionals. 
group wheel and user M Egger. So the wheel group and M Egger can X11 forward. So there, you have all sorts of this. Now, not everything can be used uh, in match. Not all of the spe specifications within OpenSSH allow that, but quite a few of them do, and I would check the man page if I were you to figure out what they actually are. The other nifty one you can do, so let's say match group naughty. These people are bad, and I don't want them doing bad things on my machine. They, we gave them a little bit too much freedom, and they, they took it. So let's go ahead and chroot directory percent %h. This group, all the people in group naughty, when they are logged in, are now chrooted into their home directory. That's pretty cool, huh? Now, that being said, you still have to set up your chroot properly. If they weren't just doing it in your home directory or anything, anything you want to run inside of a chroot, you have to put there. Don't forget that. So, you know, this is how you make SSH do it. Configuring the chroot is up to you. So the percent %h it will modify that. So you could say their home directory or you could say slash home slash percent %u which is their username. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about is root access with SSH. And now we're gonna be very clear on the opinion on this. Say it with me, no. One more time, no. We don't do SSH across root, as root. Now, there are, I've seen it before, I know things that use it. Sometimes if you have a configuration manager such as Ansible, Salt, Puppet, Chef, it's easier just to do a root key from the master or from wherever you're executing this code. Oh, that one I'm gonna call a gray area. Um, I'm sure some more secure people would call me and say, no, you should just be using sudo. But then you have to have that sudo password and it has to be passed and it's like when it's being typed in, it's in plain text. So does that really solve the issue? I mean, it is still an SSH thing, so it's encrypted, but you're still, I don't know. If it, you want this to be automated, you have to somehow manage that password. And uh, So that's one of the things. But root access for everyday use, no. Pseudo in. If you need root access, you pseudo in. Why? When you go straight in this root, you lose all audit trail. You pseudo do ask all of that. They all log whenever somebody changes into root. If it, you're not paying attention to who's logging in as root, you have no idea who came in your system and did what they did. And that's bad on a logging trail. Also, by allowing users to log in as root, and I've actually seen this, um, you encourage them to make root a development environment. Um, not everybody. I'm not talking on the sysadmin side, but you know, I've I've seen people with their own VMs and such, and they develop as root and I'm like, what are you doing? No, like your user doesn't need that much privileges. If you need it, pseudo. My personal development, I, I mean, my my user is an administrator account, but I don't develop as root. Like you, you start changing things and you modify things. You know, all of your major system services are like started by root. If you change the environment, you may have some impact on them. You know, it just, it's a bad habit. You should not be root. Um, can it be done? Yes. Will I show you? No, I'm not going to show you. In the actual book that I got for this stuff, Michael Lucas says, uh, it makes me guilty of malpractice. And I actually have to agree with him on that. By showing you on here how to permit it, it's, go it's, it's feeding you bad habits and it makes me guilty of malpractice. So I'm not going to show you. There's a wonderful world of Google if you really want to know. It's not too terribly hard. Um, but personally, no, I'm not going to commit that. Um, Another thing that he says, and I'm going to take this as a direct quote from him, logging in as root via SSH almost always means you're solving the wrong problem. Step back and look for other ways to accomplish your goal. I 100% agree with that. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. I really do hope that you learned something. Uh, you know, I consider OpenSSH to be kind of a basic for just about everybody, and personally, I like focusing on the basics. So I really think that it's a good idea that we take a step back and actually, you know, deeply understand the tools that we, you know, we take it for granted. You know, we type in SSH every day, but do we really know what it's doing? 
most of us don't. That being said, I hope you liked it. Uh, if you like this video, leave me a like down below. If you want to come back and see me again, go ahead and subscribe. I really do appreciate all of those of you that are, have been subscribing to me. I, I get the emails every day, and I'm just always really happy that I get another email. I'm like, man, another person is subscribing to me. Thank you to those that are subscribed. I hope you like it. I hope you continue to stay subscribed, and you know, bring your friends. It's a lot of fun here in BSD land. If you don't like the channel or have some constructive criticism, go ahead and leave me a comment below. You know, if you want, put a dislike. But if you leave a dislike and you don't leave a comment, you're basically opening a bug report without any title or any sort of comments whatsoever, and you expect me to fix it. And quite honestly, that's impossible. So thank you for tuning in, everybody, and I hope to see you next week.